Okay, welcome to the Easy Peasy Mealtime Show, where parents and professionals get together and talk about tips in helping kids who struggle to eat. I'm your host, Dawn Winkleman, and I am a pediatric speech pathologist and feeding specialist, and I'm here to introduce Melanie Potok, <laughs> speech-language pathologist and feeding expert. She is the author of the award-winning Raising a Healthy and Happy Eater, and we're going to talk more about her book and her upcoming new book and um, more tips throughout the whole lap. So welcome, Mel. <laughs> hey, <laughs> you just tuned in. We spent about an hour making sure that we had double screens. Yes. But then, you know, the technology uh, elves yes. <laughs> visited and now we're on the same screen, which is fun because we get to sit really close to each other. <laughs> What's amazing is that if you haven't seen either one of us in person, we're about five foot 11, six feet tall each. So this is probably wouldn't work with any other therapist. We'd be really out of screen. But since we're the same height, it's perfect. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. We are talking about one of my favorite topics, and that is busting feeding myths. <laughs> and so we are going to bust some myths with Mel and um, we're going to start off with our first one, which is basically something that I really loved. So 2014, I believe it came out and I had my own private practice and, and I don't even know if you know this story, Mel, and I'm doing therapy with kids and parents are coming in with this copy of a blog and they were bringing it to me and asking me all kinds of questions about sippy really? cups. Yes. Yeah, I, didn't, I didn't yeah. know this. And, um, and I got really excited that it was starting this amazing conversation, which is really a hard conversation to start because sippy cups is just so, you know, parents are so attached. The kids are so attached. And it's just, it's just a really um, hard discussion. Yeah. So we're going to bust some myths tonight about sippy cups. Do they have to go everywhere with you? So let's bust it, Mel. <laughs> Tell us about sippy cups. Well, um, that that blog uh, was one of the first ones I wrote for the American Speech Language Hearing Association. And I called it Step Away from the Sippy Cup. But, you know, it, it really did go viral yeah. and kind of took me by surprise. And maybe it was just the title, but I think it might have also been the content. Um, I still have my, the sippy cup that my two girls used. I mean, I get that. It, it, there's something about it. It's so cute when they go onto the sippy cup, but I've noticed that there's a whole generation of parents right now who truly believe that we're supposed to go from bottle and breast to the sippy cup and then open cup or straw cup. Mm -hmm. And that's actually not the case. So, you know, we're all about understanding that there's a whole development process about the way children develop feeding skills. It's just like learning to walk, crawl, run, or maybe crawl, walk, run. That would be better, yeah. right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> well, um, likewise, feeding is a developmental process. And really, the sippy cup is something that was invented by an engineer. And he sold the idea to Playtex. And then it's been marketed so well that now people think they're supposed to go to a sippy cup first. The reality is sippy cups are just there to keep your carpets clean. Mm -hmm. So a little bit of sippy cup use is fine. And of course, please keep in mind, there are certain children who may need a sippy cup because they aspirate or have some other medical issues. That's not what we're talking about right now. Um, we're talking about just most children hanging on to a sippy cup for way too long. Mm -hmm. And the myth is, is that, is that don't your sippy cup, don't leave home without it. Take it everywhere. You know, we all do that ourselves with our mugs, a cup of coffee and whatever we happen to have in our, our um, hand. And have you ever noticed that even strollers now have a little indentation for, for the, the sippy, sippy cup? Yep. yep. So instead, I really want parents to understand that you easily could teach a nine-month-old, actually even a little bit earlier if you wanted to, to drink from a straw. Mm -hmm. And so, Dawn, on one of my websites, one of my websites is parentingandkitchen.com, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and there is a free toolbox tab where you can click on that and you can download all the steps to teach a nine-month-old how to drink from a straw. Um, and if you'd like to use a sippy cup occasionally, that's fine, but hang on one second. Let me grab one for you. And I am putting that in the sidebar parenting in the kitchen. Oh, great. Parentinginthekitchen.com. So here's a typical sippy cup. And you're probably wondering, okay, well, what's the big issue? Well, the issue is, is that this hard spout that sticks up in sippy cups, when it lies over the child's tongue, my hand here is the tongue. When it lies over the tongue, the kids learn to suck 
just like they would on a bottle. It really is a bottle. So instead, we want kids to be able to take their tongue and rise up to the alveolar ridge, which is where you say a D or a T, and develop more of a mature swallow pattern. You and I swallow, watch me, like that. Little kids from, oh gosh, almost up to a year are still swallowing like that. And this will exacerbate that motor plan. So instead, we want them to have something like a straw. Let me grab that. Mm -hmm. So Don, you know, here's your typical little take and toss cup. Yes. And I've added an extra long straw here. Um, and again, you can follow the steps to teaching a nine month old to drink from straw. I like a silicone straw. Do you use these too? Yes, I do. Yeah. They're just Actually. nice and soft. Mm -hmm. You can't collapse them, but they're mm -hmm. gentle on the mouth. Mm -hmm. And once you've taught your child how to drink from a straw, then you're going to cut this straw down so that there's only a little tiny bit sticking out. Mm -hmm. Now the tip of the straw goes to the tip of the tongue mm -hmm. so that the tip of the tongue can then rise up with every swallow and they can develop mm -hmm. a mature swallow pattern that really makes a difference in terms of mouth development, mm -hmm. facial development, mm -hmm. and also being able to repel back more difficult foods. Like have you ever noticed kids who have that little bit of a tongue thrust? They have yes. a hard time with carrots and oh, rice. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So you can really help your child by getting them on a straw cup as soon as possible. Fantastic. And I see that some people are having some time, hard time um, launching to so just kind of reload because we were having technical difficulties at the beginning. And so that might um, assist. So great information regarding the sippy cup. For those of you who are not familiar with Blab, if you see those two little hands right here on the edge of your screen, <laughs> if you love what Mel is saying, just give her a kind of a little bit of love. So I know like as this? a host, it's That's like this, it's like this. <laughs> so that I know that you're really interested in that information and maybe we'll expand upon that a little bit more um, or that we can give you more information and sites that you can look at. Like we just wrote down Mel's um, site parentinginthekitchen.com so that we can get you guys enough information because I know not only do we have SLPs here tonight or and other OTs who are feeding therapists that are working with kids who struggle to eat, we also have parents here tonight. Mm -hmm. And so we really want to be able to not only just give you the tips that Mel is, is talking about and busting these feeding myths to be able to help you on your journey, but we want to also give you enough resources. So just give us some feedback by raising those hands. All you have to do is click on it. Um, and also you can, on the sidebar, you can type into your questions. And so I can um, tell those to Mel and they can answer those questions specifically. Um, or you can also tweet. So on the side, you'll be able to see a little bird. You can tweet that and kind of tell anyone else that is listening um, that you're that you're on Blab, or if it's something that's specific that might actually help a parent, you can share that with Facebook over on that corner, or you can tweet it too. And if you guys are wanting to follow Mel, her Twitter handle is at my munchbug. If you want to follow Easy Peasy, it's at Easy Peasy Fun. So I wanted to throw those plugs in before Great. we go to our next Super. our next myth. So our next myth is skip the puree and give them whatever you're eating. Let's kind of bust that. <laughs> so as you know, there's a big trend right now. It's been going on for, for several years um, that we just skip purees. And I just um, recently wrote a new book that I'm hoping will meet parents in the middle from where the pendulum has really swung from no purees, never present a food to your child's mouth, excuse me, a spoon to your child's mouth mm -hmm. and whatever you're eating, just give it to them. Because with that anterior posterior tongue thrusting pattern that we just talked about, they'll just be able to push out foods and they'll learn to chew and swallow eventually. Well, if you follow the developmental process of learning to eat, that isn't quite accurate. And without going into too many details, let me just tell you why I love purees. If you want to skip them, no big deal. But there's so many advantages to them. So I don't know if you've gotten a copy mm -hmm. of mine. You just mm -hmm. got a copy of my new book. I did. And so <laughs> let me show you that. This is her new book, Baby Self Feeding, and it is amazing. It'll be out in the next couple of weeks. So stay tuned because Easy Peasy will be doing a giveaway with your book yes. and with one of our mats. And I just have to throw in this plug because if you turn to page 82, <laughs> ah, 
here is a picture of a little one using our mat. And so Mel is talking um, about those tips that we've just discussed in her new book, which is coming out in the next couple of weeks. So be sure to kind of <laughs> keep a lookout for that. This particular book, I was really excited to be invited to write it with Nancy Ripton, who is a wonderful author in Canada. And we wrote it together over the phone and over email. And we've never met in person. And um, it was it was awesome to get to know her because she's an excellent, excellent researcher. And uh, uh, baby self-feeding really helps you find a balance between mm. a baby led weaning model mm. and what I think is important and what feeding therapists think are important and oral facial myologists, which is really focusing on mouth development mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and purees have a lot of advantages. So the message I'd like to um, make sure everyone hears is that first of all, that I need to drink water. Hang on. <coughs> Excuse me. Can everyone still hear us? Okay. Sorry. <laughs> okay, good. And <coughs> pardon me is that, Purees are not a bad thing. We just don't want to linger there. Um, if we don't want children to be strictly on purees. <coughs> Pardon me. A feeding well, therapist uh, and yeah. speech pathologist. It always gets us. <laughs> we we always end up having the sore throats, losing our voice, and, and choking when we're talking and, and trying to drink at the same time. So. I just got done teaching a two-day course in Pittsburgh, and I'm a little hoarse, so mm. bear with me. So back to purees. Um, the thing about purees is that if children are exclusively on purees past, <coughs> past the age of nine months, that they it has been shown that they can become very picky eaters. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's very, very important that we do offer children a variety of foods, a variety of textures, a variety of flavors, spices, etc. Mm -hmm. And you can do that from the start, except be very aware of choking. And please follow the American Academy of Pediatrics guidelines around choking. Um, in Baby Self-Feeding, the new book, I give you lots of different fun recipes. I give you a step-by-step -step plan to get your child onto re regular grown-up mm -hmm, food, because mm -hmm. this is the kid's menu. I hate that right. stuff. Too. And, um, and have them feel very comfortable and confident with those foods. But purees are the bridge to getting there. Mm -hmm. So what mm -hmm. are some of the things you love about purees? So what I love about purees is the ability to be able to transition to other things. So we can't do dips and dippers if a, a, a dip has never been introduced. So we're right. skipping all these wonderful foods that we're trying to introduce to kids and be able to, again, increase texture and flavor. And if we don't have a dipper to actually dip in, if we don't have a puree, then they can't really learn those things. And the other thing that I love about purees is that if we're dipping, dipping something into a puree, we're able to see what their tongue function is all about. That's because true. Because we mm -hmm. want to be able to be, how are they going to be able to suck this out? If they're, are they capable? Are they going to have to, you know, suckle? Are they, you know, putting it on the side of their mouth? Are they licking it? Which right. I, is another real, you know, um, key to kids who've actually done baby led wing and strictly no purees. And then I give them a dipper for their first time and they just start licking because they don't, they don't know what else to do with it because they don't really have those oral motor skills to be able to do that. So, and you know, you bring up a good point because the prerequisite to straw drinking is being mm. able to suck puree off a spoon or at mm. least suck something of a puree like consistency off a finger, mm -hmm. off a broccoli stalk, that'd be okay too. Mm -hmm. But ideally you want something that's flat because you want your top lip right. to clean off that spoon and really activate the swallow mechanism. Your mm -hmm. lips are very, very important for mm -hmm. propelling food back. Most right. people don't realize that. Um, another thing I love about purees is the kids get really messy. And even when we're handing them some of our food, you know, maybe we just had some cheesy broccoli and yes. just give them that big old stock and it's steamed and absolutely let them mouth that. It'll get deep in their mouth. It'll help to um, uh, push that gag reflex back mm -hmm. to the back mm -hmm. of the mouth. All of those things are wonderful as long as it's not chokeable. But purees get kids messy. They, mm -hmm. they really develop their mouth muscles and their lip muscles and even their muscles underneath here, which are so important mm -hmm. for speech mm -hmm. by sucking off a spoon or sucking purees through a straw, even like a smoothie. And we all eat purees. Right. So again, the message is just don't linger there. Use it as a bridge to getting to the more advanced foods. And the new book, Baby Self-Feeding, walks you through that process.
And that's perfect. And when we were talking about purees, we're also talking about actually smoothies and juices. I mean, we're talking about a continuum of foods that are usually healthy. And so in order for us to be able to, you know, transition those right. foods to be able to have kids, you know, dipping into a smoothie with their hands, which is what they normally will want to do is, hey, you just got that smoothie, mom, let me take a little bite of that, right. um, to being able to drink from a straw and be able to go through those developmental milestones. So again, it's called baby self-feeding and stay tuned to um, to Easy Peasy's uh, Facebook because we're going to be giving away one of these books with one of our mats here shortly. I totally want to try one of these gloves. Do it. <laughs> so did we bust that? I think we bust that. Did we bust that, everybody? <laughs> Busted. Busted. <laughs> and did we bust the sippy cup one too? Absolutely. Busted. Busted. <laughs> so this is dangerous to have us I both know. on the same screen. I love it. <laughs> Um, so for those of you, again, who are new on Blab, feel free to type in those questions on the side, um, tell a little bird and, and tell Facebook that you're enjoying some of these feeding tips. So let's go on to number three. Number three is stop playing with food and just eat it. I've heard that <laughs> so many times. Okay, Miss Dawn, great. You guys played in food for a little while. And when is my child going to be able to eat this food? Or when is my child going to be able to eat on the restaurant? Or when is my child going to be able to eat Thanksgiving meal in front of my in-laws? So let's talk a little <laughs> bit about playing with food. It's really important to play in food. And um, kids are programmed to explore the world. They, they have many, many nerve endings on the palms of their hands and on the tips of their fingers. But do you know what? We have even more nerve endings from our lips down our throat. And when you think about a little baby who goes to grab a little tea there and bring it up at midline and, and really mouth it, um, that is their first exploration type experience. And the same thing goes with handing them a uh, perhaps a nice squishy bit of avocado, a slice of it, and really letting them squish at it. Maybe they'll bring it up and suck on it too. But there's, I, I'm, I have to tell you about this person right here. Um, this just showed up and she is <laughs> the expert in playing with food. There is a brand new book that, when is this going to launch? July 1st. Oh, right when baby self-feeding does. Exactly. Oh my gosh. When we'll be doing another giveaway. <laughs> and look, it is all about playing in food. And the entire book is so awesome. It's got these thick pages. What are these? These are like coated so you can yes. wipe them right off. Yep. And there's themes and it's all about helping kids explore foods with all of their senses. Mm -hmm. That's the way kids become adventurous eaters. It's Thank awesome. You. you did an awesome job. Thank you I so love much. It. I'm just going to keep this one. You don't need okay. to Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so Team Easy Peasy is launching our first book called Easy Peasy Mealtimes um, with a happy mat. And so that'll be coming out July 1st. And we will be doing yet another giveaway on our book, the Easy Peasy book, as well as Mel's book. So um, stay tuned for that too. And if you follow us on Facebook, it's Easy Peasy Fun. And um, my Munchbug for Facebook to be able to kind of know what the giveaways are going to be coming up. So. And if they want, they can just go to mymunchbug.com and you can click on all my social media icons and I'll take you right there. Don't go to the Melanie Kotak page. I'm never there. Go to <laughs> my munchbug. <laughs> Perfect. I didn't even know that. Too, so yeah. Great. <laughs> Um, so playing with foods, basically what we want to do is we don't want to shun one side or the other. And that's what Mel is talking about in her entire book. But we think that there is a happy medium. And I mm -hmm. think a lot of us out there who are, you know, doing feeding therapy, who are seeing a whole bunch of kids who are seeing moms who are struggling, um, trying to pick one method or another, or be able to kind of blend two. Right. I, I think that is really, there's something to be said to be able to, you know, have some purees and have some, you know, solid foods and to be able to kind of walk that fence because that's what we all do. We all aren't on purees and we all aren't just on solid foods. That's right. That's right. And kids really need to experience all types mm -hmm. of foods in order mm -hmm. to um, develop their mouth in an appropriate manner. Mm -hmm. So absolutely. Yes. Any questions on that? All right. Uh, yes, good point. So they're asking if it's going to be possible to watch the recording later. And yes, absolutely. So on Tuesday, we launch a blog and it will have a link to this blab that we're doing right now live. The and Easy Peasy blog. The Easy Peasy okay. blog. So if you go to easypeasyfun.com and you click on the blog, 
it'll be there. And every Tuesday we launch a new blog and we discuss different feeding uh, tips and this will be next Tuesday. So absolutely you can uh, click onto that blog and the link will be on there as well. So that's good. So playing with food, just eat it. I think we busted that. Did yeah, we, we busted bust that. that. Boom. <laughs> okay. Boom. Any other questions on the side? I'm trying to, to um, be able to keep track of that and also be on the same screen. Yeah. So number four, we are going to talk about taste. He doesn't like the taste. How many times have I heard that from parents and therapists? I'll say, well, let's try this, whatever it may be. Oh, he doesn't and like that. Exactly. Yeah. That's exactly what we yeah. get. He's not going to like that taste. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about that. Let's bust that myth. Well, you know, even some of my older kids, the very first thing they'll say to me is, but I don't like it. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, it's icky taste, you know? And the thing is, is no matter what we do in life, we still have to practice it. I didn't like math. <laughs> I still had to practice it until eventually I got really comfortable with it. And children, it's really important that parents keep presenting the same mm -hmm. tastes in order for them to become more familiar and more comfortable. Mm -hmm. But what it's really about is not so much about taste like sugar, uh, excuse me, um, sweet, salty, mm. bitter. Those mm -hmm. are tastes. What it's really about is flavor. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of families don't understand that flavor is um, is really a multitude of sens uh, sensory input in your mouth. Mm -hmm. So to put it simply, when taste combines with smell, and we actually have olfactory glands way up in our throat that mm -hmm. help our brain detect smell while we're eating, when taste plus smell combines, that's called flavor. Yes. And another aspect of flavor is called mouthfeel. And you'll hear all the top chefs talk about this, but that's mm -hmm. where all the other sensory components come into play. The weight of the mashed potatoes on your tongue, mm -hmm. um, the, the warmth of the mashed potatoes or the broccoli or, or the root or the, if it's room temperature, mm -hmm. or even is it icy cold straight mm -hmm. out of the freezer, like mm -hmm. an ice cold popsicle, mm -hmm. or has it been out for a little bit and it's started to melt a bit and it's a little bit more comfortable, mm -hmm. or perhaps the kids love icy cold. Mm -hmm. There's so many different aspects mm -hmm. to flavor. So I recently actually just a couple days ago, wrote an article for the American Speech Language Hearing Association, and that's what's called Taste Versus Flavor. And if you just Google POTOC, P-O-T-O-C-K, Taste Versus Flavor, you can learn a lot more about this. Be sure to click on the hyperlinks in mm. those articles because that'll take you to even more information. These articles are short, so you, that'll take you to additional research and other articles that might help you. Great. Yeah. Any questions regarding taste and flavor? Or or anything that we've discussed so far, the sippy cups or the skipping the purees, any questions so far? I'll give you guys a few minutes while we, we talk about that. And I'm so excited to see so many SLPs and OTs fun. and we can parents see you on, on here. here at the same time. Yeah, wow. So exciting. So yeah, this is great. Ugh, just to have so many, so many friends. And Jennifer, thank you for being on again. Every single time you you come on, I'm I'm so grateful. So thank you so much for for doing that. Okay, we're gonna move on, but feel free to just write your questions on there. So I think that the taste and flavor, I think we busted that. Myth, I think we right? busted that. Oh. <laughs> All right. So moving on to number five, which is really near and dear to my heart, and we'll talk more about Easy Peasy's campaign here in a minute. But you know, let's talk about booster seats. Do they boost kids up? Boost your seats? Do they boost kids up? Let's, let's bust that myth. <laughs> well, when I was a little girl, uh, we would just take a couple um, phone books and duct tape them together. And I sat on that at the dining room table. And the thing is, yeah, it boosts kids up, but it's a, a square booster seat, you know, something very upright that doesn't have any support around it is a really hard chair mm. to sit in, not just mm. in terms of hard, firm, but difficult because when you're sitting on just a hard platform like that with no backrest and no footrest, I've seen kids at restaurants, you put in one of those hard booster seats mm -hmm. and slide right under the table. Those seats are fine on a temporary basis. But if you really want a child to stay comfortably at the table and be a part of family meal time, which is the most important mm -hmm. thing to me, 
and that they really are interested in trying new foods, they have to be sitting with good stability. So um, there are a lot of different high chairs out there and we highlight several in both books. Everybody likes that. They got to have some yes. stability, right? Because yes, kids right. will always seek out stability, always. But uh, without going into a lot of different brands, because everybody's got a different high chair, the mm -hmm. thing to remember is that you want their little hips to be positioned in such a way, if I can show you here, not at a 90 degree angle, but a slightly smaller angle, stick their little booty out a little bit so mm -hmm. that when they mm -hmm. close that angle slightly, they have mm -hmm. a little bit more stability. Make sure they've got something under their feet. Mm -hmm. If you Google POTOC and tips for preschool teachers, you'll see a beautiful picture there of how to adapt any chair so that it has a footrest. Mm -hmm. uh, we also want kids, especially the smaller children, to have some support around them. So whether you're gonna use a beach towel or uh, roll up some of that spongy waffle weave that we mm -hmm. all use mm -hmm. under our rugs, mm -hmm. right? I yeah. buy that at the dollar store, by, by yeah. the, yeah. And just roll that up and create a horseshoe and put it around your little kiddo's um, hips. Provide them with a little bit more support. Mm -hmm. If you're out at a restaurant and you have your, your diaper bag with you, you know, many of us have um, a sweater or a towel or mm -hmm. even... Um, a mat that you change the child on to obviously we're going to make sure that it's, it's clean. We all mm -hmm. do that anyway, mm -hmm. roll that up and use that around the restaurant booster mm -hmm. seat. If you can give them something to provide nice stability and they're able to sit at the table longer so that they can fork a pee, you yes. know, yes. so that they can take a drink from an open cup or, or pick up a, um, a straw cup and not poke mm -hmm. themselves in the eye. Mm -hmm. Or eat something new because they're actually new. at the table longer to be able to, you know, that they have that stability, they feel more comfortable. They might be able to eat a little bit more, stay with the family a little bit longer, right. you know, try that new food that we've presented to them all because they are in a better position. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, um, you know, sometimes we have to use a booster seat and in baby self feeding, our new book, we have some, some examples of seats that would be appropriate for a six month old up to an 18 month old, because mm. that book is about the first year of solids. That's six months to 18 months, Great. raising a healthy, happy eater. Our other book, we have more ideas for you, especially how to help children come up to the counter and be a part of cooking and be mm. well positioned there as well. Just remember that kids will always seek out stability. They'll find a way they'll hang on. They'll hook their little toe under the high chair tray, but you were doing a campaign last week about yes. just ditch that tray. Yes. Our campaign through Easy Peasy is called Ditch the Tray. And basically what we're kind of highlighting is that you can actually take off the tray to the high chair and just push baby right up to the table. Then they're more and, a part of things, right? Absolutely. And not only that they're more a part of things, so is mom. Because sometimes, you know, we have these selfie Saturdays, which is so fun with Easy Peasy and, you know, families across the country and therapists are showing these pictures of kids at the they're table. Really cute. And they're adorable. And sometimes mom and baby are in the back corner with the Easy Peasy mat, which is great. <laughs> and the rest of the family is at the table. And so mom and baby are away from the family. And right. we're trying to just tell parents as well as therapists to just engage those kids, bring that chair up to the table. They can still be in the high chair, just take the tray off and bring um, baby to the table and mom too, and be able to kind of ditch that tray and just allow them to explore and actually do all the things that you're talking about busting those myths is, you know, now the child has more stability. They have the positioning that's better. They can play with more of the food. They, they have more surface area to exactly. play on. They have more food around them. Yes. Whatever anybody else is eating, it's right there for them right. to experience. And and they can reach over and grab a little more of that puree or yeah. reach over and grab with something that you're eating because they're actually at the table. Right. And again, having baby there at the table allows them to not be so picky because they're being, you know, um, um, being more accustomed to all the flavors and the smells and the, and the sounds of mealtime that are so important. And if they're mm -hmm. stuck in a, in a corner, they're really not getting that information. So, and then also we won't need to have a sippy cup because now we're going to have so much more room to be able to drink out of an open cup or to be able to drink out of a straw cup to be able to kind of engage that. So definitely, definitely. I know we've got a little bit more time. Yes. I'm wondering if anybody else has yes. on this they'd like us to bust yes, or, please, or questions. Please. I can come up with 10 more, but and I'd love to hear what we they We can keep expanding too. So, <laughs> so we're speech pathologists. We can talk. We can talk. <laughs> um, we have a 
question here. Just like the sippy cup, the market saw the opportunity and flooded the market. Yes. Look at Europe. Most eat at the table and it's like we forgot to eat together as families. And that's so yeah. true. And, you know, when when I'm talking with parents, they're saying that it's it's more out of necessity and convenience that these things occur. Right. Because that's yes. where this all started is, you know, if you're driving one child to and from and you just, you know, you have to use that sippy cup for that moment in time absolutely like absolutely. there's there's definitely sure. room for that if you know you have to eat out of a booster chair because you're going to your favorite restaurant and they have this very slippery booster chair that they use just to be able to clean it down and and get the next kid in but that you can actually move that to the table get the proper positioning like mel is talking about be able to use a mat to be able to hold on to help mm -hmm. um keep that positioning i love your bowl for that thank you oh yeah. yes it's so great especially for children with visual impairments yes that yes. they can really grab onto the bowl yes. and hold on and get an idea of where their hand is in space. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely, absolutely. Because because it's the table, they can hold onto that edge and kind of lift themselves back up. And so if you see babies starting to do that, then you can, as a parent, you know, reposition that um, beach towel and be able to have that in the right position. And um, But a lot of those booster seats do not have foot support. So that is something that you kind of have to like work at in the restaurant as well. Um, but anyways, bringing baby to the table, you're being able to kind of just knock off these myths right away to be able to right. you know have them there. Right. So, oh, so we have a question here about pouches. Let's oh, talk about just, pouches. I was just going to say, can we talk about pouches? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Another, another myth. Oh, so I think myth is, and at least what parents say to me is, you know, my kid doesn't have any problems with purees, none whatsoever. It's not a texture issue at all, as long as it's from the pouch. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So let's yeah. talk about that a little bit. Well, you know, it gets back to convenience. Yep. And the occasional pouch is fine. But because of the world we live in, we're all on the run. And <laughs> it's just so darn easy to hand the kid in the back seat and in his car seat, a pouch. Mm -hmm. And I get that, you know, if I had little kids right now, I think I would do it occasionally too. Mm -hmm. But again, I, I really ask parents to please limit those for a couple different reasons. First of all, even though they have tons of, of um, fruits and vegetables in them, they have a lot of sugar and it isn't mm -hmm. necessarily added sugar, but man, you got to grind up a lot of apples to fill up one of those pouches. And it really has an effect on cutting the child's appetite immediately. So for example, I have this wonderful family I work with and they pick their little one up from preschool and on the drive home, hand her a pouch that has some, a little bit of spinach in it, you know, not a lot, but apples mm -hmm. and spinach mm -hmm. and blueberries. And that's nice. But by the time she gets home, she's not hungry for lunch of course. because her blood sugar is perfectly level. And um, if you are going to use them, get the itty bitty ones, just use them on occasion. Mm -hmm. And if it makes you feel better that there's some vegetables in there, maybe try making your own pouches. Mm -hmm. And when mm -hmm. you're making a smoothie, fill it the pouch up. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of different ways that we can use it. Mm -hmm. The only thing is one other suggestion. I do like if you're going to have a pouch, buy those little caps that have a silicone straw sticking yes. out and screw it onto the pouch. Yes. Now they do need to suck. You can squeeze a little bit, but the mm -hmm. kid will start sucking. Mm -hmm. They'll get better lip closure. And it's more like drinking from a straw, which is going to mm -hmm. help with uh, development of the orbicularis mm -hmm. oris muscle. That's your kissing muscle. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a very, very important one for certain speech sounds as well. Mm -hmm. So you want to be able to work this muscle just all the way around your lips. The as wrinkle well as the ones. Cheeks. The wrinkle ones. We don't talk about that right now. <laughs> <laughs> you have the filter on this, right? We, no, we, right, we, right? we look 20 years younger on this one. <laughs> so Another suggestion is that you can use the pouches and you can put it onto a spoon. You can put them into a cup. Sure. You can drink them. There's so many different ways that you can use the pouches if we're using them for convenience. Yeah. Um, or the other thing is to you can use it if you're going to use it for convenience, but don't let the kids see the packaging because so many of my kids get really stuck on the package. Yeah. So, you know, if it's a blueberry spinach, that's great. Um, but we want to eventually transition to blueberries and spinach. So we want to be able to do that. And if they get stuck on those pouches, right? Yeah. I mean, and then they get, and if they change the packaging, <laughs> big problem with some of our kids. Uh, the other thing is, is that we want them to be able to explore different ones, right? So if you're going to a grocery store in another city, which just mm -hmm. happened to one of my clients, and they don't carry that specific pouch brand, the child's not eating. 
Um, so we want to make sure that we, we kind of like use, again, variety that Mel keeps talking about, but using the variety of foods and not using them in the containers. And I say that with pretty much everything. If you're doing right. applesauce, take it out of the container, dump it into our happy mat and <laughs> um, and be able to, you know, have the kids kind of explore the taste and, and that. Work on the too. dipping and then the yep. self spoon feeding and, and the food exploration. Mm -hmm. It's really... The advantage of the pouches, the kids don't get messy. The right. disadvantage of the pouches, the kids don't get messy. <laughs> right. So there's time and a place, but limit them if you can. Absolutely. Absolutely. So if you just came on, which I just saw a couple more people came on, you can add your questions to the side and we're going to talk about um, more myths. That way uh, we want to make sure that we get the information that you guys are looking for. And as you guys are typing that out, I just want to mention again, if we want to connect with Mel, if you're on Twitter, it's my munch bug. If you want to connect with easy peasy on Twitter, it's easy peasy fun. And if you want to connect with us on the website, it's easy peasy fun.com and my munch um, Let's go to a couple other myths. How about this is this is another one for me. And I'm going through because I have a kid on my case. So that actually is, again, we're talking a little bit about them being in the corner, um, but having to have mats down underneath a high chair tray. So, which is great because, you know, in my clinic, I had to have it. I had to have a mat sure, down underneath sure. the high chair tray, but our kids are throwing them. They're, be, you know, they're throwing their plates. They're becoming messy. Let's talk about the myth of having to have a, a mat under the tray. What do you think? So. I'm going to put you on the spot. <laughs> okay. Put me on the spot. <laughs> so one of the things is, is that, you know, we, if we're bringing baby to the table, then the table is what's getting messy. And so, you know, having that high chair that's being pulled out, you know, having a mat underneath in the therapeutic setting, and there's lots of therapists on here, you know, that's all we have the choice for sometimes is trying to keep the clinic clean as much as possible. But I see that also in the homes. When I do in-home therapy, you do in-home therapy is, you know, babies in a corner with a bit, this big mat underneath, which is, you know, protects excellent carpet. Uh, but, you know, we want the baby to be underneath you know, um, position correctly at the table and be able to use something large. And again, that's why I came to work for Easy Easy is because it really is this great solution to plates being tossed and more mess on right. the carpet right. um, because it collects that mess and being able to, you know, be there at the table and also see the modeling from all the other family members that well, they're not throwing things. You know, I, I think it's that we're not necessarily against mats. It's just totally. that what that totally. mat tends to do is it tends to create a boundary around the high chair yes. and yes. isolates the child from the rest of the family. Yes. Um, we tend to kind of put them in the corner where the mat is mm -hmm. and where the mm -hmm. mess can be contained. Mm -hmm. So it's just something to think about that if really think about not getting so, uh, addicted mm -hmm, <laughs> to, to mm -hmm, the mat, you know, mm -hmm, gotta be over there where, where the right. mat is. Another thing I really think is important is that as soon as a child steps out of their feeding chair, whether they're a, honestly a year old and just beginning mm -hmm. to walk mm -hmm. or whether they're a five-year-old who's climbing down from his own chair on his own, if they have dropped or intentionally thrown a spoon or a fork or their own food in a very casual way, I encourage parents to please say, Let's pick up our mess. Mm -hmm. Don't mm -hmm. make it fun because they'll mm -hmm. look forward right. to it. Don't Absolutely. let the dog run in and look up after them because that's only reinforcing of that behavior. Yes. Instead, let's take a minute to pick up our mess. Mm -hmm. And just like we teach kids to pick up their toys in preschool, mm -hmm. even the itty bitties, make sure that they're taking a minute to just pick it up, be casual, put mm -hmm. it up on the counter or drop it into the sink where whatever they can reach, whatever you need to help them with. Mm -hmm. And help them understand that if it gets thrown over the side of the table or the tray. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. It's gone. I don't even pay attention to it. I, mm -hmm. um, uh, our local newspaper here years ago wrote this article about what I was doing in the community. And that was lovely, but I loved their headline. It said, I never pick up spoons. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. And I don't, I yeah. don't. And if we all have that attitude from the moment that babies first start mm -hmm. with solid foods, never ever pick up what they drop, then they never learn to do it intentionally. Mm -hmm. So I come to the table it, with a, a spoon. My light is, I uh, just want to adjust it here for you so you can see. I come to the table with three spoons, a spoon for me and two spoons for this little fist because they mm -hmm. always want to hold on Absolutely. to it. Do you notice that? Yes. And then if things get pitched, we see it with our fingers, even if it's puree, because I love kids to get messy. Yes. Playing with food. Again, Playing going back to that. Um, any other questions? Because I can just keep 
<laughs> rattling off more and more myths. Um, so one of the things that we talked about in our book, Easy Peasy Meal Times, is how we use language. And let's mm-hmm. talk about the myth of, you know, you're supposed to say certain things at the at the table. Right. Um, one of the things that we wrote about in our book is our language use when we're inviting kids to the table. So instead of, Johnny, it's time to eat. We say, Johnny, look at our happy mat, what we made for you. I mean, then it ends up really being an invitation, right? We want to be invited yeah. to to the dinner table. And so if if you say it's time for lunch, usually they're like, oh, I want to play with my Legos or they want right. to do something else because they don't want to you know, try that new food. Um, but being able to use the language and be able to... Um, to, to say, you know, your happy mat is ready or look what I made you or something, you know, using some positive language to be able to do that. I like to play a song. I always like um, on top of spaghetti if you're going to have pasta, uh, you know, and I like the kids to uh, I, I have a bunch of songs on my laptop. It's from my children's CD dancing in the kitchen and you can download those. They're only 99 cents each. Just go to my munch bug and click on music and you'll be able to see any of those songs. But one of them is on top of spaghetti. And if you have them right on your phone or your device, your laptop, whatever, if the kids know to press start, hey, come help me press start the music. They run to the table to press start and start the music. And then everybody gathers around the table. It's a way of them participating and gathering everybody together. Yes. I like that. Um, Lindsay, I saw that you were trying to, to call in. I'm so sorry. Can you try again? Okay. So Lindsay, the, my boss from Easy Peasy is joining <laughs> us. <laughs> Thanks for watching, Lindsay. It should come on any second. Or maybe not. Technical difficulties. That's you might okay. not be able to. She'll come on in a minute. Do, Do you mind if I keep talking oh, while please, you're working on that? Please. Yeah. You, oh, oh, there she is. There. Hey. I was. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> what well, you guys were just talking I about. Can't hear you, Lindsay. Oh, no. We can't hear you for whatever reason. Oh, oh no. Okay, just wave, you guys. Just wave. But she's showing, she's showing part of her book. <laughs> oh, there's a boy. Hi, kids. Hi, guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. They're the original reason this mat was yes, invented, right? They are the Those darling reason. children right there. Yes, they're so cute. And I love them because, you know, Lindsay is so gracious. Yes, we come into her home all the time. and We, we filmed the whole entire book at her house. And so we had the three little ones just running around and here I am therapizing them the whole time, you know, oh, oh, you're done with your easy piece of meal. Oh, take it to the table. I mean, take it to the sink. Oh, rinse it off. Like, um, you know, <laughs> also being, being therapized. So it's yeah. so cute that they're actually watching us. And so thank you kids um, for, for watching. Um, so we have a, a comment here. Ella loves sitting at the table with me to get ready for dinner. She loves picking up the mats everyone uses. That's so great. Because, you know, that's that can be a job, right? We talk about so much about yes. kids being in the kitchen and doing jobs, and that could be a really good job for them to, you know, pick up the mats and being able to take them in. So wonderful comment, wonderful comment. Uh, and I love that comment, too, because it gets back to what we were just speaking about, which is really marking the beginning of a, of a meal with the kids playing a song, or maybe they ring a dinner bell, or maybe, you know, even the youngest kids can help to, um, you can safely help them light a candle to mark mm-hmm. the beginning of the meal, say a prayer, sing a song. But also what she's speaking of is marking the end of the meal. Mm-hmm. And even for little kids who, gosh, are two years old, mm-hmm. I want them to take their plate to the counter. Mm-hmm. Because when you teach your kid to take your happy mat to the counter and put it away, even with all the food, and if they need to run around and play and the adults are still eating, they're only two, that's fine. Mm-hmm. The thing I want them to know is, We'd love to have you come back to the table, but there's no more eating. Mm-hmm. I want kids to understand that when you put your plate up on the counter, you're all done eating. We'll have something you need to eat after we go to the park. I always want to say something reassuring that, yes, absolutely mm-hmm. more food is coming. But mm-hmm. you put your plate on the counter. You show us you're all done. Mm-hmm. Stay at the table until you're done. And they'll figure that out quite rapidly actually and gosh it's wonderful because the longer we can stay at the table together did you know you you know this that columbia university has some amazing research about how families who eat family meal times um specifically dinner but my goodness it could be breakfast Mm -hmm. regular meal times together their children are less likely 
to um, get involved in drugs, in mm -hmm. poor decision making in high school, in making safe decisions. Mm -hmm. And that's the way we want to raise children, yeah. not only in terms of what they're putting in their body, um, in terms of food and health and nutrition and nourishing their whole soul, essentially, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but also mm -hmm. making safe decisions in the world. And one of the best ways we can do that is family mealtimes because you talk at the table. Right. Yeah. So you want those kids to stay at the table from a young age as soon as possible. Yes. So true. And we actually wrote a little bit about that um, in, in our book, The Easy Peasy Meal Times. And we're talking about like it decreases suicide rates, increases yeah. communication, so many things that family meal times do. And again, when we bust all these myths and actually have baby at the table and, you know, no pacifier in the mouth, no sippy cup in the mouth, you know, and they're able to eat um, meals with the with the family, then we're going to have all those things. We're going to be able to connect. And that's really what this is all about. I think so. And I think really giving, uh, as a mom, if I hear this stuff, mm -hmm. and I think I would be, if I weren't a feeding therapist, I'd be thinking, I can't have dinner every night. I can't have too much going on. Just pick one meal to start out with mm -hmm. and make that mm -hmm. your regular family routine. I have a family right now and they make pizza together every Sunday night and mm -hmm. their little six-year-old um, mm -hmm. isn't yet learning how to eat pizza, but you know what? It's learning how to make it and that's the start. Absolutely. Yeah. So as we wrap up here, um, if there's any other questions or comments, be sure to put those in the sidebar and we'll address them really quickly as we conclude. Um, for those of you who weren't here at the very beginning, we will have a blog on Easy PC's website on Tuesday with the link, uh, some of the information that we shared today, as well as a link to this particular video. So if you found that this video is really helpful, you can actually share that with others. If you're, in a, if you're a feeding therapist, you can share it with some of your clients. If you're a parent, you can share it with some of your parents who might be struggling with some of these issues. And we do Show where parents and professionals come together to talk about ways to help kids who struggle to eat. So we will definitely have them back soon if you if I come. <laughs> absolutely. When you're ready to be all done, I actually have a little surprise for you. Oh, cool. Right, are we about there? Because We're about there. Stay tuned. Are you ready for this? Huh. You're, you're making me think about what we had talked about in terms of seeking out good positioning and being able to stay at the table longer, especially for kids who are learning from an open cup. Mm. So Don doesn't know this, but hang on. Ooh. I'm excited. Another feeding therapist. Oh, we're going to do a little experiential <laughs> yes. activity. Oh, I like where this is going. Should I still be recording this? Yeah. <laughs> So if Lindsay, your boss, is still watching, there's water in here. If not, water. hang on. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. But why are we really doing this? Okay. First of all, because it's that time of day. But second of all, I want you to think about this for a second. Okay. I want you to think about a little one maybe a three-year-old in a booster seat, mm -hmm. nothing under their feet, nothing around their hips, mm -hmm. and they're trying a new food, and they're trying to drink from an open cup, and they're trying to use their fork on some peas, because you just want to beat some peas. And instead, what they're really focusing on is being able to balance on a hard seat. I want you to think mm -hmm. now about you being on a bar stool, okay? And you can practice this at home. If you were on a bar stool, with no footrest, and you just had to sit there and use all of your trunk to maintain control, no backrest. If the bartender handed you a martini, oh my goodness, it's so it's full, so full. Yeah. you would be paying so much attention to mm -hmm. how to balance this, where your hand is in space, that's our, our mm -hmm. sense of proprioception, yep. and how to bring it up to your lips in order to take a sip. And then how to put it back down without spilling. And as soon as you handed me that, I immediately started engaging my core. Yeah. Because I have to keep this stable. I don't know where this is going. <laughs> so I have to keep this stable so that I don't dump this onto my computer 
or or spill it on Mel's lap. And so, yeah, we're really engaging our sensory system to be able to to kind of keep it steady. That's right. And that's what we're asking little kids to do when we don't provide them with the right stability. We're making them sit on a bar stool with no footrest and drink from an open cup that is trying so hard not to spill or try new mm-hmm. food or mm-hmm. stay at the table for a while. So this is your assignment for tonight, all the grown-ups. <laughs> I don't care what you fill it with. I want you to grab a wine glass or something with a stem. I want you to sit on some sort of stool and make sure your feet don't touch the floor. Make sure your back isn't up against something. That's your booster seat. And I want you to try to drink this. And how long can you really stay there? You're going to be surprised. So cheers. Cheers to Thanks that. for having me. Thank you for being <laughs> here. And thank you for watching the Easy Peasy Mealtime Show. Thank you so much. And all the comments here are just like, you know, thank you so much. We love you. And in your mouth. Yes, absolutely. Um, and we have a, a comment here. Thank you. Looking forward to attending your course in Texas. <gasps> so, Austin, yes. so let's talk about that really quickly. So Mel, what, what cities are you going to be in next? Well, if you go to mymunchbug.com and click on events, you'll see the cities that I have for 2016. I'm almost full for 2017. So if your agency or hospital, if anybody would like to have me come and do my two-day course or my one-day course or even a parent event, um, please get a hold of me right away because, man, we book out early. Uh, I'm very excited, though, because I'll be going to Austin. I'm going to Biloxi in a few weeks. Um, I'm hoping to be speaking in Philly at ASHA. We should hear about that great, soon, great. but definitely I'll be there. And um, uh, tomorrow we'll be talking to someone about going to Australia. So Excellent. you can reach me at melanie at mymunchbug.com. And if you can't find it, just Google Melanie Potok, P-O-T-S-E-K. It'll pop right up. We'll have all those links onto the blog, which will be coming out on oh, Tuesday. Great, and we're actually going to be at ASHA, too. So yes. Easy Peasy will have a booth there. And so any of you that are speech pathologists, you can see us both there at ASHA. And thank you so much for attending the Easy Peasy Mealtime Show. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Good night. <laughs> that was fun.